is from uh, one of the messages, the story called uh, College Borough. It's about a, a writer from New York who goes out to a college in the Midwest and uh, doesn't really enjoy himself, and so he makes all of his students uh, reconstruct the flat iron building, uh, turning them from aspiring writers into professional plumbers, roofers, electricians, and the like. Uh, and the economy, as it always does, goes on. Uh, I'm just going to read a small part of it. You're not going to get the rebuilding of the, of the flat iron building, but just uh, just sort of the setup. And uh, it's this. All right. How's that? So it's just the uh, the opening of the story, and uh, we'll see how it goes. I helped build the flat iron building, though I've never been to New York. Though Dem and I had never been before indulging our daughter Barry's desire to visit New York University on my one week off this year and Barry's junior year spring break, despite our hope that she, our only child, would choose to stay in state. The decision is hers, but we, we keep telling her in state was good enough for us. After all, that's where we met. Dam and I had four classes together pri prior to applying to Professor, Professor Greener's workshop. It was competitive, certainly, but he accepted us both for what reasons we years ago came to terms with. This in the days when Dam was still doing poetry, not yet motherhood and the career of a freelance interior designer. The days when I was writing fiction as if literature were life. And now here was Barry, our daughter rebelling against our rebellion, she was bent on studying some profane concatenation of finance and psychology. She wanted to be employable, while well, all I wanted was to avoid the flat iron. And because I did, I insisted we do everything downtown. We'd sleep downtown at the Wall Street W, the hotel I'm writing from now by midnight on W stationery with a W pen. We'd eat downtown. Dem is an unreconstructed gastrophile when traveling, a compulsive cuisinist who keeps files on restaurants, docs and XLS spreadsheets of what dishes and deals can be had on what days where. We tour and enjoy exclusively downtown, historic districting around the Trinity Church, the Exchange, the new trade center being built going up slowly, slowly after a decade of stagnancy. Soho art galleries and village bebop shabam clubs, Dem had downloaded discount admissions, struggling improvisational comedy sellers. She'd scanned vouchers for three late sets free. And Wednesday, if we can fit it in, one or two interactive museums. Downtown's also where the school is, or rather, the school is downtown, having taken everything over, the streets are the classrooms, not in some ridiculously wistful sense, but legitimately, or rather illegitimately, privately owned, zoned for children only. Beat, foot sore, inadequately caffeinated, Dam and I stood with our daughter at the front of the NYU tour group, led by a girl named like a corruption of a Dutch cheese. Gudla, or Dugla, this cheerfully chubby checker of any survey's Pacific Islander box, majoring in, but I wasn't paying attention, let's say post-colonial beating or basketry as therapy. She was very kind to Barry, very patient and always touching, damn it even me with a bit to the cuticle fingernail graze of my elbow, a head a palm to my shoulder, tender, but then she'd think nothing of reaching out with a surprisingly firm grip and turning Barry's head to direct her attention. Over there's the library. There's the Center for University Life. Here are the freshman dorms, where you'll be living next year. What a presumptuous girl. I told Dem I wasn't impressed and she shushed me, but I could tell from the side of her smile she agreed. I'm saying the physical plant wasn't much, prefab, incapacitated by its overcapacity, smogged. Now I know no city can contain all the amenities you'd find at a place like our, uh, like our alma mater. A city university just doesn't have the space, no matter how big the endowment, 
No matter what sums of R&D cash are banking around, Manhattan Island is only so large, and it's telling that about half of its lower half is landfill. Back home, we have more chlorinated pools, more recreation facilities with more stationary bikes and stairmasters, treadmills, and the latest in weight machinery. Hell, we even have the flat iron, if you want to forego the elevators and walk up it. The faux iron, Professor Greener once called it whose roof I laid about 20 years ago, with Barry turning 18 this September. I did a fine job on that building, finer workmanship than anything we saw in our tour, save for a few of the older buildings. I'm talking the stolid stuff, actually of the 1900s, those tiles and carvings from when we still cared about craft, those noble columns and colonnades and ornamental gutters, all the fineries I learned to duplicate the techniques that usurped my writing to give me a destiny with salary and benefits. You want Peterson's roofing to do up your house, but first you want to look-see our standard? Go down to auxiliary field number three. Incongruous, isn't it? Insane, perhaps. Jutting from amid sports pitch and prairie, a skyscraper visible from the Mississippi, as the meeker, more Mormon guides claim when you take the tour of that campus. That slight wedge of trouble that has us wedged south of City Hall, that was Dem, that was me. Clients call impressed. I do well for myself. A very would thrive, 20 floors below that turbid eclipsing, 1,750 miles away from 175 Fifth Avenue. Professor Mari Greener, was invited out to our flyover square state to be writer in residence for the 1992-1993 academic year on the merit of his recently published and only book, a novel about its author's formative years so searing, so bridge and tunnel burning and explicitly realistic that we couldn't resist ravishing it for autobiographical fact, an interpretive approach that Greener both practiced and abhorred. So, Art reconstitutes bi biography. Or better, biography like iron can make art like steel. But then the art can be heated again and the iron reseparated, the biography flowing molten all on its own. What a significant simile, such a suitable image. He, greener, like his hero, who shared his initials, height, weight, eye, and hair color, wardrobe preference for rye denims, and predilection for Delhi, was born on the Brooklyn Queens border at the conjunction of those two potent across-the-water boroughs so fetishized for having provided the nativity of so much authentic, impactful culture of the century past. Irish, Italian, Jewish, and he was the lattermost. He wouldn't let you forget it. Greener was the first Jew I ever met. Now, I was a student of literature. Not a student of the study of literature, but of the making of literature. Already there was the vocational calling, the desire to be trained to task, to do, to make. And though I was a voracious reader of the right writers, the lustier ethnics, the wasp authoritarians, practically speaking, my experience was nil. Jews were in the Bible. They were of the Bible. They weren't on my TV or in the movies I borrowed. They made the TV and movies. I didn't expect him to have horns or anything. It was Dem's family, typically exasperating in-laws, but also bison ranchers, who passed along that stereotype. And when Dem mentioned it to me after reading up on Greener before he arrived, I immediately imagined a man with air horns or megaphones grown out of his head. And it wasn't like I was expecting a version of Shylock or Fagin, but I was not prepared for the irony that fuck you and fuck your mother cynicism. This was because, memoir, self-writing again, he was raised without a father and had to toughen up fast. He had to learn. He taught himself, as his book's protagonist, M. Grunick, had taught himself how to fight, how to stand up for what was his. What was his was Stuyvesant, followed by climbing the ivy uptown, rungs above the college Barry and Dem and I were touring, eons, humanities education-wise, beyond our own peonic undergraduate and graduate careers. And of course, he had his book, which followed this titular Grunick, quote, 
an amateur erector and semi-professional ventilation inspector through myriad menages a trois and a quatre in downtown New York of the mid-1980s. What that book had earned him, low advance on low sales, hysterical acclaim, and once remaindered, once out of print, this sinecure stint in the provinces, teaching us hicks to write good. It seems that the 80s, the decade of my adolescence spent lurching days between milking and collecting eggs at my parents' dairy farm and video gaming after homework, was the last tolerable decade in New York despite the city going broke, despite the crime. It was Greener, who had eight years on me, who taught me to qualify. For him, it was the decade of punk rock, hip hop, rap, graffiti as art, heroin, coke, a scene where everyone became millionaires at their mixed media before dying of AIDS, or as Greener wrote, quote, wrote excessive books about excess that were never excessively read. Though, he once recommended, the hardcover's dust jackets were useful for cutting up lines. The last decade before the encroachment of the rest of the country, before the suburbs moved in to the urbis. All that pseudo-culture that Greener hated, the chain stores, the mega malls, the ATMIs, shop fronts, unmanned but anyway lit and heated and air conditioned 24-7, 365. He hadn't been around any of that before it began coming to New York. Downtown definitely has all the familiar logos by now, and just when it came, he decamped to its source. He came to our state, our city, our cow college town, the world capital of bad, depressing, homogenous capital. We had, we still have, unupdated, unredone in airport, a strip of consumer options, then up the hill, the college on the hill, and when he first arrived, his second night with us, arriving unaccompanied at 35, balding and fattened like a species of livestock new to us who knew our livestock, but still recognizable as ready for slaughter. He invited Dem and me out to dinner, along with a half dozen fellow students, but not because he wanted to bond. He said, don't think I want to bond. It's just that your girlfriend's too pretty, which for him passed for a compliment. He stood us around of dollar margaritas, I didn't have the heart to tell him, my fiance. That character still sounded too foreign. All throughout dinner, we were introduced to that hilariously raw style of metro complaint, the perpetual bitching of the provincial Manhattanite. Could the food here be any worse? Could the service be any worse? Could the fluorescence be more industrially fierce? Which were cornier, the corn tortillas or the restaurant's muzak and decor? The decorations were stapled sombreros and hefty husks of lacquered maize, a burrow mural in dishwater pastels below dish-sized speakers blatting juvescent pop top 40. Could the conversation at the surrounding tables be any stupider? Could the people tabled around him be any stupider? He was caustic. Could he get a new knife? He drunkenly clumped his last to the floor. The food was nominally Mexican his request. But did we take him to Taco John's or Casa Agave? I'm not sure which chains we had then. It was pre chichis but anti-Chipotle. Chilies? It's about as Mexican as Hitler, he said. As Mexican as Spetzel, he said. Then, after the flan, wiped his mouth with the zarab that served as a tablecloth and said, OK, here's your first assignment. Then he took a shot of tequila and said, margarine-flavored tequila. For our virgin workshop in this burg, I want you to write a story. I want you to write a story about our dinner tonight, but make me out to be the biggest asshole possible. I want to be fictionalized, hyper-fictionalized, let your imagination graze free on the range, have me robbing this joint, have me taking a shit in the rice and beans, out me as this pretentious pinko kikabilly snob, though still deigning to rape your wives, and he looked at Dem, then looked at me, and winked. Hand that in, he said, or else. Or else? It was like the entire wait staff asked that too. Bring me anything you want. Staggering out of the restaurant, he was slurring. But I'll only read a story if it's finished.
inspired me to put that drink in there. <laughs> oh, wait, I shall attempt to turn myself on. <laughs> Press it. Whoa. <laughs> now, I speak with the voice of God. Uh, I, I'm going to read uh, just a, a short section from a long story uh, called The Wedding Jester, which is in this new book. And uh, it's, uh, this is a moment uh, at a wedding in the Catskills that uh, Saul Bozoff, who is a 40-something failed fiction writer, uh, has escorted his mother to uh, a, a big wedding uh, in the Catskills about 50 years after the heyday of the place. Um, so it, it's just everything about the experience is, is disappointing uh, leading up to the wedding itself. Um, so here begins, uh, the theme from Exodus had started up over the public address, which was apparently the cue for the wedding procession to begin. First the groomsmen, then the bridesmaid marched into, in, in double file, their full dress ensembles repeating the pastel floral scheme. A crinoline toddler strewing rose petals waddled behind them herself followed by a boy in a Tom Thumb tuxedo bearing a ring on a cushion. In their wake came the bride, escorted by her father, and the sight of her gliding over scattered petals, her breasts nestled dove-like in the empire bodice of an alabaster gown, her face tantalizingly obscured by a chiffon veil, chased every other consideration out of Saul's mind. He's been fantasizing about this young girl. He's 45-ish, celibate, miserable, self-loathing, and uh, I, totally strange sort of character that you can see. <laughs> Her intended waited at the altar, imperially handsome, his slender frame flattered by the white cutaway with its crimson wooden ear. Beside David stood his own flushed father, pot belly corseted in a silk cummerbund, looking either smug or pickled in his capacity as best man. Giving his daughter a melancholy kiss, Mr. Saposnik handed her up the steps to the altar before taking a seat next to his wife. There, the girl was greeted with a wink by Rabbi Lapidus, rocking on his heels at the center of a coupe. Smart in a madras dinner jacket, the rabbi clutched something Saul at first took for a staff of office, but turned out to be a handheld microphone. For once the participants were in place under the canopy, the wedding suite fanning out behind them like a choir, the rabbi brought the mic to his mouth with a practiced panache. Baruchu haba Hashem Adonai, he crooned, while Saul wondered why such a showbiz production should even bother paying lip service to tradition. Of course, he didn't know Hebrew himself, nor had he set foot inside a synagogue since the confirmation of his 16th year, an ecumenical affair that in the reform movement replaced Bar Mitzvah. Saul had not been Bar Mitzvah. His Jewishness, Jewish, his Jewishness, like his connection to his mother's family, was several times removed. But for a brief bibliography of fables he felt increasingly had been written by someone else, Saul regarded himself as an artificial Jew. So what made him think that his presence among this company should have anything to do with providence? The first sign that something was wrong occurred after the second benediction, when the rabbi invited the couple to drink alternately from a goblet of wine. The Shapiro kid took a modest sip, but the bride, when her turn came, upended the cup and greedily slaked its content to the dregs. Then she emitted a most unladylike belch and wiped her mouth with the back of her hand. A shocked murmuring rose up among the guests subsiding only after they assured one another, at least those in Saul's hearing, 
that Shelley was just a little high strung. The ceremony proceeded on a note of tension, which relaxed a bit as the groom began to recite after the rabbi the marriage formula, Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, who hast made man in thine image. Vows were exchanged, the brides with an especially breathy deliberation, and the groom, receiving the ring from his father, who, to the delight of the crowd, rifled his empty pockets before remembering the ring bearer, tried to place it on the tapered finger of his betrothed. But before he could succeed in this, the girl snatched the ring from his hand. She threw back her veil, disarranging a complicated black braid, and examined the stone through the loop she made of her fingers. Then, wresting the mic from Rabbi Lapidus, she blurted in a Yiddish-inflected voice that bore no resemblance to her own, You say rock, I say schlock. Let's call the whole thing off. <laughs> Nevertheless, dropping the ring into her bodice, her wedding guests collectively forgot how to breathe. <laughs> Turning toward them, Shelley Sapoznik appeared for all the world like some callow ingenue with stage fright, though the words that came out of her conveyed no hint of trepidation. Maybe you heard about this fellow started a line of maternity wedding gowns. When his geschwollen sein geschäft, the room was deadly silent. I said, you should see how his business is growing. Not a sound, though the girl, or rather the voice that had borrowed her, remained undismayed. It's not every line can bomb twice, it declared. So Ethel and Amy are discussing Einstein's theory of relativity. He explains Amy to Ethel, all this means everything is relative. It's like this, but it's also like that. It's different, but it's the same, harsh taste. Nine, says Ethel. Give to me an example. Okay, let's say I stoop you in the fanny. I got to prick up the fanny and you got to prick up the fanny. It's different, but it's also the same. Now you understand? Ah, says Ethel, but I got only one question from this Einstein makes a living. <laughs> the party on stage, but for Shapiro, who guffawed, remained frozen in place, while the only movement among the folding chairs was from seniors reaching for pills. The doorbell rings and enough goodbyes, continued the bride, who was not herself, her body rigid, a helix of hair dangling over one eye. You know, enough goodbyes, dear, a whorehouse. So the madam answers and finds there a poor soul with no arms or legs. What do you think you can do here, she asks him. The cripple says, I rang the doorbell, didn't I? <laughs> Standing on either side of her, the groom and the rabbi traded glances of stunned bewilderment both of them afraid to touch the girl. A susurrus of murmurs was again heard throughout the cabaret. Don't laugh so loud, you'll start a landslide. I mean, startle a landslide, unless they're thug. None of the mordancy escaping Shelley's lips was expressed in her face. The bridal veil trailed like a vapor from her inky tresses, which, though she'd yet to remove a muscle, seemed to have grown even wilder. Her gown had fallen off a pale shoulder. Cornish Telfin, said the voice. We got here the night the undead. So what should I say to make friends? I want to sleep with each and every one of you. And I mean sleep. I ain't had a moment's rest since I croaked. The murmuring had swelled in volume to the hum of an aerodrome. But seriously, the voice went on. It's great to be here in the bosom of Shelley Sapoznik. And such a lovely bosom it is. Forty years I'm in the cold, I can't find shelter to save my soul. And believe me, I wasn't so young when I died. When I was a boy, the Dead Sea was only sick. <laughs> the hand she lifted to quell the laughter that wasn't forthcoming looked as if raised by a puppeteer. But this one, this maidel, is so delicate, so graceful, like a gazelle, so empty. I mean, hello, the girl knocked mechanically at her own temple as the voice echoed from within. Is anybody home, home, home? But don't you think I ain't grateful? Who else can accommodate a whole extra person without doing a timeshare? Boy, Shelley Kaposnik, such a princess. Ever see her eat a banana? <laughs> Pretending the microphone was a banana, the bride made believe she was peeling it then placed a hand behind her head to force her open mouth toward the fruit. Gasp! of revulsion greeted the pantomime. The bridal party beginning to break ranks, 
Mr. Sapoznik, having mounted the altar, appealed to the rabbi to, for God's sake, do something. While Rabbi Lapidus, checking his watch, replied that the episode was outside his jurisdiction and screwed up his face to ask himself what he meant. Infuriated, Sapoznik gave him a shove which jarred the rabbi into asking if there were a doctor in the house. <laughs>